Himmel Brothers lover, deep into the COVID-19, this is John Chapman's Imperial, loosely modeled after uh, Sears Robux jacket from the 30s. And uh, we make them too, with special permission from Goodwear Leather, my close compatriot. And I just made this one this month for a client. Today, uh, I'm putting the blast buttonholes into this jacket as a button up cuff. So we're gonna show how we do that. And then I'm gonna discuss the, the beauty of this jacket, the leather and the design. So I hope you enjoy it. Look, I'm wearing nitrile gloves, woo! So I gotta put two uh, cuff buttonholes in this jacket. The thing you should know about buttonholes, which uh, the reason I do them is that uh, if you screw up a buttonhole, you have to cut, take apart the jacket and whatever panel, you got to put in a whole new panel. You can't go back, can't do it a second time. It's always stressful. But I've done it so many times. I know the sound and the feel of the machine. I can tell if something's going to happen or if it's gonna screw up or not and uh, 10 years now I think I've only had to redo two buttonholes which is uh, I'd say that's a pretty good track record okay so uh, this is a really cool very traditional 30 style cuff when we make the cuff we line it with a uh, cotton twill so a real nice durable smooth black cotton twill and that gives it less wear and makes it feel not rough on the wrist and lock it down put buttonholes put buttonholes don't fuck up your jacket So, the buttonhole completed. That's a gimped buttonhole, beautiful texture, great look, good position. Our hand sewn button, and we do it up. And winner, winner, chicken dinner. This Imperial is a classic 30s, 40s sports jacket. And it's, in the vintage collecting world, is considered one of the most beautiful of the sports jackets. Now, uh, John adapted the pattern directly from a vintage jacket. So he's very good at, at, at that sort of process. So I trust his patterns and this is why we're using this particular pattern. A lot of different companies make versions of this jacket because it is such a predominant jacket. Now, typically at Himmel Bros, we're not a replica jacket company. The designs that I do are not replicas per se, but new designs that could have been old designs, things that I create from my mind. In this case, this is a classic sports jacket in which we try to recreate identically an original jacket. Um, it has this pointed cuff here, which is very interesting because this is much more of a European design feature than an American design feature. And you often see the influence of the tailors in the 30s that worked on contracts to design these jackets in those features. So when you see a pointy cuff like that versus a rounded cuff, you would typically see that in a European leather jacket in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. They have a lot more points and arches Whereas things made in Canada are sort of a mix of the points and arches of European design and a more rounded, practical, functional shape of North American design. When I talk about how jackets are designed, I usually split them between European, that would be like French, Dutch, German, Italian, and then European British, which has its own unique flavor, then Canadian, which is somewhere between an American style and a British style, and then American style. 
the important thing to know about that is that typically all the people doing the design work on these jackets from my research and my family history you got a lot of east european jews setting up shops in different comp in different countries applying or trying to adapt to the local aesthetic standards of those places this is pre-internet this is pre-social media and so everybody's doing these things in isolation but they're very w aware of other companies innovations and product product and then in in the american model because of the development of big department stores and chain stores and mass media they're way more competitive and innovative because you could be making a jacket in Los Angeles or San Francisco and you would be aware of your competitor in New York or Toronto or Montreal because often you're vying for catalog business. You're also uh, <clears throat> uh, providing your local market, but then you're also doing contract work for JCPenney or Sears or Eaton's or many of the mail order stores. And so these guys were much more integrated in terms of competing and therefore in a way you see a real explosion of innovation in American design. So Sears wouldn't necessarily have had their own factories when they were designing this original design. Rather, they would have been contracting out across the United States. Maybe they had this style and someone made it in New York and they had this style and someone made it in San Francisco and they would shop that contract out. Maybe they only sold the style on the West Coast or they didn't sell it on the East Coast. But the people, it's a bit of an imaginary process, but you have to get into the mind of the people that were behind the design of the jacket. And in this case, because I've seen so many jackets from all these different places during different time periods, you can see specific design influences appear and disappear in jackets. So the sports jacket is a very American style jacket in, in that it was very sporty, functional, good outside for work. It wasn't, it was like a three quarter half belt typically. So half belt refers to the sort of like belt around the back half of the jacket to tighten it at your waist. And and it had this sort of blend between something like a bomber or a Cossack jacket, but, and not a three quarter jacket, which was more for sort of rugged elements and protecting your whole lower torso and upper torso from elements, sparks, grease, coal, whatever you were wearing it for. And this was also worn in casual wear, hunting, working, you know, leather jackets were considered work wear. So, so this, this pointy bit with the wide cuff, that's a very European, Germano, Dutch style cuff. But then the shape of the sleeve on this jacket is a very typical and cool American Canadian sports jacket sleeve with a real nice, generous arc on the elbow. And that's so that it's real comfortable to, when you bend your arm that there's a lot of give. And also, because this jacket doesn't have any venting behind the arms, no by swing back, no gusset, that bend in the elbow gives a lot more arm movement back behind the arm because when you have the give here, it doesn't strain the leather behind the shoulder as much. If you have less give here, then it has to give somewhere behind the shoulder. And if, if you don't have a gusset or a by swing back, then your arms basically get locked forward. So a lot of the arm shape in this design gives the give for the back. Now in this case, we have the two slash pockets here. And those, those are, are just typical on a sports jacket. We have this waist piece which is a combination of one, you have two very large front panels and it's easier to cut smaller panels. So rather than create an entirely long front panel, you can break that into two pieces. Two, it's aesthetic. It just, 
it looks very nice, but three, you can see there's a slight flare down at the waist. And when you have that panel there, it sort of demarks an aesthetic look on the body where you're gonna get that flare on the panel. In, in this jacket, we have a chin strap. We have a classic, really clean American collar not particularly shaped it's not like a w collar it doesn't have any arcs in it it's just a, a real classic turn down collar we used a universal brass conmar replica zipper so universal is the heritage line from ykk japan and they make a very good solid number five zipper that zipper pull shape is the classic war era conmar zipper and they've recreated that with their own branding on it. This jacket is in an oil finish, shinky, dark brown horse hide. So let's talk about the leather first. The base leather at Shinky is a full veg, uncorrected, full grain horse hide, which this jacket is. And then the finishing is the color and the various configuration of oils and substrates that they put into the leather after they're done. So in this case, this jacket has a aniline finish combined with some oil and some wax, and that gives it a bit of shine and a bit of waterproofness on the surface, but it also gives the jacket a feeling of a heavier body. And because of the shrunken grain in the horse hide, which yields less jackets per per horse, obviously, because the horse is shrunk, you're losing 30% of the square area. Okay, now let's talk about the back of this jacket. Now, as you can see, the Imperial here is a half belt jacket. And if you notice from the back, you can see a very aggressive triangular shape. It's really beautiful. Again, wearing this jacket has a great shape. You can see the lovely curve in the sleeve, which is gonna give a lot of movement. And you can see that there's a little extra leather material and that the back shape of the armhole is created such that you're gonna get a little bit of give right here, which is one of the major pressure points when you wanna move your arms forward. So from a design perspective, this is a really great pattern. Uh, from a functional perspective, it's a really great pattern. From a design perspective, it's a very interesting uh, pattern. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is this half belt with this yoke, this keystone yoke, and this waist panel. So, from a manufacturing perspective, cutting a back panel is quite expensive. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of leather in a jacket, but when you add up a typical jacket, it's 35 to 40 square feet or square decimeters, because they're pretty much equal, of uh, leather, which adds up to about a skin and a half or three quarters of a horse. So you, when cutting a jacket, are basically with all the panels and all the shapes and all the overlap and all the wastage, using about three quarters of an animal the size of a horse to cover a typical size 38 human male. So that's quite a lot of leather. And when, you, when you're using uncorrected leather, and that means leather that doesn't have any sanding or texture or fake grain or heavy paint to cover over all the scarring and take away from the natural beauty and the health of an animal. And we haven't really talked about that. I'll talk about that another time. You want often to have less large pieces. Now, there are advantages to large pieces of leather. One, a really high quality jacket from pre-1970, large pieces showed an expensive sort of design process. So it either meant that leather wasn't too expensive, time was more expensive, sewing time, 
but also large pieces tend to suffer less failure. Every time you cut and stitch a seam, there's a possibility, if you don't do it right, of that seam coming apart. So construction is very important in terms of how you sew and glue and stitch tension and stitches per inch and needle size for putting panels together. Now in theory, and in case of Himmel Brothers in practice, when you're doing that right, those seams are just as strong as an uncut piece of leather, okay? You can see this has what I like to call a keystone back. So keystone is when you have an archway, you have a rounded stone and then stones cut to create the arch and that keystone, that center piece, holds the whole arch from collapsing. This back is a very aesthetic choice, but it's also a choice in terms of choosing smaller pieces of leather to cut from. Now the problems of choosing different pieces of leather to cut from is that you can get different tonal shades, especially with aniline finishes. So you can see, and we might be able to capture it on the camera, I don't think so, that this center panel is a slight light shade different than the left panel and the right panel, right? Um, I call that character. We try to match the color of all the pieces when we cut the leather. We try to cut the pieces from the right pieces of the leather so that the grain matches up, so that the thickness and the stronger parts of the hide are used for the more abraded uh, sections of the jacket. So this has a double yoke that refers to these two points that are on the yoke is the shoulder piece. And then it has these three back panel pieces that creates the keystone. And then this is the half belt, which is where your belt would be on your high-waisted pants. Excuse me, and then this is the waist piece. Now, as you can see, the side panels create the shape or the curvature in the back of this jacket. The waist piece is actually tapered inward, and that creates a really nice arm motion. This is all tied to the shoulder arm motion, but also that the jacket sits flat and very snugly around the back, giving the person who's wearing it a really nice shape. The half belt is literally what that is. You have these waist adjusters, they pull on the half belt and they adjust the jacket at the waists for a nice tight fit so it doesn't pop up. And from an aesthetic perspective, if you recall, I talked about those European cuffs, cuffs in the, that point. In German, in Dutch, in Swedish, in Italian, and in some cases French jackets, pre-World War II, you often see this double yoke with these pointy yokes. You see it in Nazi jackets. You see it very typically in leather jackets in Europe between 1900 and 1940 and even after the war. And that's a very European feature. So you can infer from the design of the Hercules jacket, which is the Imperial, which I'm making, that whoever designed it had a strong European tradition in terms of their aesthetic. But what they did is they Americanized it. They took an American sports jacket and they cross-blended, cross-fertilized this European look on an American sports jacket. So the better, more functional North American design with the slight fancy features of this European double point. And what I like about this jacket is that that blend makes it look almost like an art piece, like an art deco art piece. When you order bespoke, not only do you get to work with me to get your measurements, but you get to choose leather, liner, zippers, thread color. In this case, this is a dark brown Japanese horse hide with dark brown cotton thread, brass hardware. And the client asked for an extra inside pocket. He wanted snaps on the pockets so that they snap close. And the HBT reversible Marine Corps camo on the green side. So, first thing you'll notice is this beautiful World War II camo. This is replicated heavy cotton twill from Japan. It's a perfect, pretty close to perfect replica of 
the Marine Corps camo that was issued in the Japanese theater in World War II. When veterans would come back after the war or even during the war, there was fabric shortages during the war. The people were frugal after the war. Sometimes when you reline a jacket, if you had an old leather jacket from the 30s and you lining wore it, you just take your old uniform and sew it inside. It's fast, it's ch cheap, it's dirty. And I actually have some vintage jackets that have been patched up inside with the old uh, military uniforms. So we offer light brown frog skin, green frog skin, uh, golden penis tiger stripe Vietnam issue, and uh, Mitchell.